Our special guest today is William Tong, the 25th Attorney General of the great state of Connecticut and the state's first Asian Pacific American Attorney General and statewide constitutional officer. I'm looking forward to a wide ranging conversation today about a number of issues that are on the edge of the news and shaping our everyday lives, including gun control, the opioid crisis, student loan forgiveness, and consumer protection. Attorney General Tong, welcome to Next Steps Forward. Hey, Chris, thanks for having me. William Tong grew up in Hartford. His mother was born in Taiwan and came to the US. His father was born in mainland China, then moved to Hong Kong. From there, he immigrated to Canada and eventually ended up in the United States. Mr. Tong received his bachelor's degree from Brown University and his law degree from the University of Chicago Law School. He served 12 years in the Connecticut House of Representatives and was my representative and was in private practice as a litigator in state and federal courts before being elected Connecticut Attorney General in 2018. As Attorney General, he has taken the lead in a coalition of 49 states suing the major generic drug manufacturers for price fixing. He was also part of a small group of state attorney generals who had led the investigation against Equifax relating to a massive data breach in which personal and confidential information belonging to millions of Americans was compromised, including more than 1.5 million residents in Connecticut. Before we get to those edge of the news issues, let's first talk about how you got to where you are today. Your dad left China for Hong Kong during the Chinese Civil War, and your mom immigrated to the U.S. from Taiwan in the 1960s. How did they meet and how they decided to settle in Hartford, Connecticut? Good question. Big question. So first of all, Chris, great to see you um, on the Zoom. I can see you. And I hope that Christine and your family are doing well. Likewise. Thank um, you. Liz is upstairs uh, taking a little nap before her next call um, because she and I got Moderna number two yesterday. Congratulations. So, um, well, I'm, except I'm a half step behind today. So I hope you'll forgive me. <laughs> of, course, of course. Uh, I'm feeling, I'm definitely feeling the effects of it, but uh, not bad enough to, to not be here with you today. I appreciate that. Thank you. So my, my parents have a beautiful story and we could do two hours on, on, on how they got here. Um, but it's an unremarkable story, uh, unremarkable in that so many people share it, right? It's a, it's a beautiful and great story um, of, of perseverance and immigration, but so many people um, have their own version of that story. And, and so many people in our own home city of Stamford, right? Which is a wonderfully diverse, and, and I think if you, you know, look at it from any objective measure, a city built by immigrants. Um, and so uh, my parents met in a Chinese restaurant called the Hong Kong Kitchen on Blue Hills Avenue in Bloomfield, Connecticut. And um, um, they were very fortunate to find each other and open a Chinese restaurant. And then, you know, for the next 20 something years after that, proceeded to kill themselves every single day in their restaurant, 15 hours a day, seven days a week. And that has everything to do with who I am. It has everything to do with, with all of the, um, you know, opportunities and privileges I've had. And, and, you know, some people say to me now, um, especially um, in, in the conversation now about um, race, right. And anti-Asian hate crimes. And, uh, you know, obviously so much is bubbling in, in our country. And, and, and some people say to me, you know, you've had incredible opportunities. You've, you went to Brown, you went to the University of Chicago Law School, and, you know, they, they try to diminish, right, what my parents went through. And what I say to them is, do you know how many egg rolls they had to sell in order to make that happen? I mean, literally, literally, and how hard they worked. And, the extraordinary sacrifices that they made. And, but, but I, I say that because um, um, I'm proud of them, but also because so many other people do the same thing. Yeah. And they must be exceptionally proud of you for, you know, what, who and what you are and what you've become. So, you know, a compliment to them and a testament to them for their hard work and, and their, certainly their character. Well, thank you, Chris. And the one thing I'll add is, um, you know, some people ask me in, in my elected life and in campaigning why I talk so much about my background and where I came from. Number one, because I never forgot where I came from. But, but number two, 
because I have found that if you just talk about your experience, you very quickly realize that, that so many other people have a similar experience. And so let's just take Stanford, for example. Um, I said it's wonderfully diverse, but in ways that we don't always remember. I mean, there are a lot of so-called quote unquote, white ethnic communities in Stanford, Irish, Italian, you know, and, and, and Jewish Americans, their immigration is recent, you know, the whole scheme of things, right? There's so many families in our, in our communities, in our neighborhoods where people, you know, are maybe a generation or two removed from immigrating here or not, right? We have a very large recent Irish immigrant community here in Stanford. And I think if you just talk about it, you find that your Italian, Irish, um, Jewish friends and neighbors, um, that they have very similar experiences to you and that they came here and made the same sacrifices. You know, uh, the Goldblums opened a demolition company, right, for example, or, or the Polici's, right, in the restaurant business. And it all just happened in, in much the same way. I mentioned earlier that you did your undergrad studies at Brown University. You earned a bachelor's degree in classics. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of attorneys. I'm not sure I've ever met an attorney with that undergraduate degree. Did you make that choice knowing you're going to pursue a law degree? And if so, how do you see them fitting together? Actually, you would be surprised to learn that, and I think this is still true, at the time, the one major that um, sent the most people to law school was were classics majors. And... Maybe I heard that wrong back in the day, but, but that's what I thought. And um, I did a lot of Latin and Greek in high school and it, it, it makes a difference to understand the firmament of American democracy and how it grew out of the democratic experiments of ancient Greece and ancient Rome and their failures, right? And um, it, it just naturally um, dovetailed into my interest in public policy and government and, um, and the law. And so it, it, it just, to me, it always made sense. Many people have a negative opinion of politics, especially in today's very divisive environment. What attracted you to the political uh, battlefield, we'll call it? I don't know if I love the battlefield. <laughs> Um, I think it's a couple things. Uh, number one, it's tremendously rewarding personally to help people. And I know you know that from your work in Soldier Sox and um, um, just, just packing razor blades and socks and underwear, right? And, and things for people who are serving our country abroad. And, it's, it's not a bad way to spend, you know, your day helping people and seeing the impact that you have on people. It gives you purpose um, and, and you're reminded of how often you needed help yourself. And so um, that in and of itself is, is, is very motivating. I think for me personally, growing up in a Chinese restaurant, working with my parents, seeing how hard they struggle, seeing how when they struggled, maybe people didn't help them or abuse them or cheated them or treated them poorly, makes you naturally want to protect and help your family, right? And other families like us. And so that's a very sort of personal motivation the other thing, and, and my wife hates this answer, but it needs doing, right? And um, if we don't do it, um, who will, number one? And do you trust that somebody else to do it? Uh, and, and so Edmund Burke, you know, famously said, um, bad things happen when good people do nothing. Um, and that can't be more true than, than today. Let me say this, though. Um, I appreciate your comment that politics is difficult and ugly and 
Um, it, it involves a lot of personal sacrifice, you know, particularly financial sacrifice. And, um, and I, I take a lot of criticism, but, you know, Chris, you're in the finance industry. People don't love bankers either. <laughs> Boogeyman. Got to do something with your day, right? So <laughs> I just don't know that there's anything worthwhile that doesn't have, um, that doesn't come with criticism. Um, and, and that doesn't have its own share of heartaches. And by the way, politics, you know, I love, I love this story and I hope you'll indulge me for a second, but I, I have a, um, a, a Filipino friend who's a doctor and, um, he is a relatively recent immigrant. And he said to me, you know, William, I don't understand how you can do politics and deal with all the backbiting and backstabbing and, you know, smoke filled rooms and all the, you know, um, all the, all the conniving that goes along with it. And, and, um, and I say, I said to him, Gino, what do you do? And he said, Oh, I'm an anesthesiologist. And I said, where do you work? He said, I work in a hospital. And I said, Gino, I can't think of a more political place than a hospital. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in fact, I see that scalpel sticking out of your back right now. Right. <laughs> so one of your top priorities has been to address the opioid epidemic. In February, you led a coalition of attorneys general who reached a $573 million settlement with the consulting firm McKinsey and Company for its role in advising opioid companies on how they could promote and profit from their drugs. What does that mean for the millions of people across the country who are still addicted to opioids or have lost someone to opioids? It means that we're getting some help, but not nearly enough. And that number reminds me despite its size, I mean, it's a huge number, um, almost $600 million. You know, when we were kids, Chris, $600 million was a, a boatload of money. And this for McKinsey is risk management money, right? They're not gonna go out of business, um, not even close, and especially when they do 10 billion in revenue every year. Um, and it just underscores for me, yeah, I'm grateful that we were able to, to settle this without trial and to get money as soon as possible to communities that need them, including communities in Connecticut. And I'm gratified that we're able to hold McKinsey accountable for turbocharging and supercharging the opioid crisis by advising Purdue Pharma, for example, down the street from us on how to juice their sales and lie to the American people. But you think about it, we, we suffer $10 billion in damages a year in Connecticut alone from the addiction and opioid crisis. More than a thousand people lose their lives over it in Connecticut alone. And at the end of the day, $600 million is gonna help, but this problem is so much bigger than that. So that being said, where do you go from here as you continue to address the crisis? You know, what more needs to be done? I think we are being honest as a country about how big this crisis is and how many people are responsible for it. So I have said that it's not just the manufacturers. Everybody wants to talk about Purdue. Fine. I agree. They bear an outsized share of blame. Um, but on a market cap basis, right, they're small uh, compared to, for example, the distributors, right? And it's been covered in the Wall Street Journal that state attorneys general have been engaged with the distributors in litigation, investigation, potential settlement. We're talking about three companies, Amerisource, Bergen, Cardinal, and McKesson, that if you didn't know about them, you might not be aware that they're three of the biggest companies, right, in our country. Although once you're aware of them, then you start seeing the trucks everywhere, right? Uh, but these, these, these companies are by order of magnitude so much bigger than um, Purdue Pharma. And they played a huge role in this crisis. 
And so it's not just manufacturers, it's an addiction industry. So manufacturers, um, distributors, retailers, pharmacy benefit managers, healthcare providers, those doctors that overprescribed opioids. You know, which as you dig into it, you learn so much more about the market dynamics and 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 in and how industry played a role in developing therapies and how it prejudices people in their healthcare. I'll give you an example. A lot of people credit the rise in addiction and overprescription of opioids to the way that we address pain in hospitals, right? And at some point along the line, hospitals and healthcare providers decided that one of the metrics that they would use in therapy and dispensing medicine, medicine is the patient's level of pain. And that was, I, I guess, I'm not a doctor, but that, was, that wasn't the case before that you know, a, a doctor made a decision on what amount of medicine was necessary based on the science, but not about the patient's subjective um, um, measurement of, or, 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 or feeling of pain. And so they had to find a way to measure pain. And then healthcare providers and hospitals were judged on how well they address the pain. Well, guess what? You know, people are in pain and they say they're in pain and you give them more and more pain medication, you run the risk of addiction. And that happened. And, and I don't think any of us are saying we shouldn't address pain, right? So, but you, as you dig and you learn about these things, you're like, holy smokes, what do we do about that? Gun violence is another epidemic in our country. Yeah. When you were a freshman legislator, you wrote and passed the Lost and Stolen Firearms Law to fight gun trafficking. How did that legislation come about and what outcomes have we seen as a result of its passage? So that was, it's, it's almost quaint to think about that bill in 2007 before, I, I hate to call it this, but the, before the age of mass shootings. I mean, Chris, you and I both remember when it would happen here and there. There was an unfortunate description of people going postal. That was the mm -hmm. not appropriate way to describe it because it happened at post offices. Before it happened on a weekly basis, you know, and before Sandy Hook, which particularly impacts us here in Connecticut, just to this day, I have a hard time wrapping my head around the fact that it was up the street, basically, mm -hmm. from us, right? Could have been our kids. Yep. Um, that bill was, in my view, a not controversial bill to defeat straw sellers. And basically what happens is um, some people would, who could lawfully acquire guns, um, would sell them to people who, who could not lawfully acquire guns, criminals, felons. And then when the gun was traced back to the original seller of that gun, um, because they were the original, well, they, they were the original owner and purchaser of the gun, they sold it to somebody else. When it was traced back to them in the commission of a crime, they would say, oh man, that, that gun was lost or it was stolen. And they didn't report it to anybody, they didn't tell anybody. And of course it hadn't been lost or stolen, right? They sold it. And, and it, it was people like, there was a doctor in East Windsor who had a drug problem. And so he is otherwise an upstanding member of the community race and doctor, but he had a drug problem. And so he would buy guns and sell them on the street. And then the guns would get traced back to him. Be like, oh, holy smokes. I don't know what happened to that gun. So I uh, went to Arthur O'Neill, who was a Republican ranking member of the Judiciary Committee at that time which I went on to chair later in my career. And by the way, our home city of Stanford had three chairs in a row, me, Andrew McDonald and Jerry Fox. So it's our birthright in Stanford to run that committee. But uh, uh, I just went to Arthur and I said, hey, Arthur, can we work something out? And we did. Um, and Arthur was considered a fairly um, right of center, you know, NRA aligned, Republican state legislator. 
But nobody thought for a second that, or I didn't, that we couldn't work together. And we did. And I think the problem with the gun debate is you use the term gun control. I hate that term because that su suggests some sort of big brother, right? Um, unconstitutional abrogation of rights. And I know that's how people want to frame it. I'm just talking about keeping people safe, right? We shouldn't have straw sellers who sell guns to felons. We shouldn't have unregistered and unserialized guns floating around the streets of Stanford. Why is that controversial? I, for the life of me, I don't know. Oh, by the way, Chris, the reason why I was born in Connecticut is because my grandfather who came to Hartford was a ballistics engineer for Colt. So I'm here because of the gun industry. And uh, that doesn't bother me, right? Um, but the, the, the problem is it's a law enforcement and national security question. And I was just reading an article yesterday that they have tons of guns in Canada, but not as much gun violence. And I think because they're smarter about it. You know, you mentioned that horrific tragedy at Sandy Hook in which 26 people, including 20 children, were murdered by a gun in 2012. You mentioned how personal it is for you and I being right up the road. Uh, my youngest daughter is the same grade as those children who lost yeah. their lives. Yeah. You know, as you were talking here, you, know, you played an integral role in overhauling Connecticut's gun laws. But then you, you say you don't like the word control, which I appreciate. You know, but last Thursday, we had eight people shot and killed in Indianapolis and five more injured. Is the solution ultimately to take every gun away from every American or is there a balance between people's Second Amendment rights while also limiting the threat of these mass shooting incidents? Yeah, it's the latter, right? Um, let's not have a debate about the Second Amendment because there's, there's, there is obviously room for disagreement about the origins of the Second Amendment, what the Second Amendment says, what it means. However, what is very clear, and, and people don't like to hear this, it's very clear that the federal government and state governments have the right and the role and the power to regulate gun ownership, period. Why is that clear? Because Justice Alito and Justice Scalia said so. In the McDonald and Heller cases, the two most recent big cases, um, Chicago, Washington, DC, about handgun ownership. Those are interesting cases because for, on the one hand, they stand for the proposition that handgun ownership is constitutionally protected for self-defense, okay? Then, then I think, uh, you know, gun rights activists love that part of the decision. But what they routinely overlook is that Alito and Scalia both said in plain language that states have the right to regulate gun ownership for public safety. And I think we're talking about how we do that. Right. Um, you and I can both agree that probably that people, well, I don't, I don't know. I don't want to speak for you, but, but I don't think people should have fully auto weapons. What purpose does that serve? Right. Right. Um, uh, particularly where you and I live, there's, there's no. And so, and so that's one area where some, most of us agree that fully auto assault rifles make no sense in, right. in suburban Connecticut, right? And the state of Connecticut can make that judgment. And then from there, that's an extreme example. That's an easy one, right? Then you have the debate about large capacity magazines. And I think, I think where it's really hard is trying to stop people who shouldn't have guns from acquiring them. And I get that it's hard, you know, one of the laws that I'm most proud of is the domestic violence gun law, which takes guns out of the hands of domestic abusers. And, and it's, it's, um, it was enacted in honor of Lori Jackson uh, of Oxford, Connecticut, who was murdered by her estranged husband. And, and that's another one where it's really hard to administer that um, regime but at the end of the day, you know, as a husband and a father, and someday, uh, this, I really can't deal with this. Our girls will probably find guys themselves, right? And we'll have to 
come to grips with that. But if my daughter, if Eleanor were to marry somebody and he abused her and um, I was worried about her safety, I would want people to take his guns away too. Absolutely. She doesn't get shot. Yep. Absolutely. You know, and I, I think how we do that is complicated, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. You know? No, nope, agree. So you've also made an effort to reform Connecticut's criminal justice system by eliminating mandatory minimum sentences for nonviolent drug possession crimes that have resulted in the mass incarceration of young people, particularly in Connecticut cities. Why is that an important step for social justice and judicial reform? So this conversation is, has gotten, I think, even though today we're talking about Derek Chauvin and George Floyd and anti-Asian hate crimes, even though that's very real and visceral, um, I, I think this debate has gotten too theoretical at times and academic and it's about social justice and, and equity. Um, all of that is important. Okay, but at the end of the day, there's a real practical impact to how we run our criminal justice system. So let's just put all the theory aside, right? If you take a 16-year-old and put them in prison, prison's only good for one thing, teaching them how to be a better criminal. And eventually they're going to get out. That's the other thing people don't, they, 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 they just... They forget about that unless somebody gets a life sentence, right? Unless they're going away forever, they're going to get out. And they're going to get out to a place where they don't have housing. They don't have a job. They don't have a car. They don't have education. And they're going to recidivate. And so these real practical problems have to get reckoned with, you know, and you and I live in a state where people are very concerned about youth auto thefts, right? And, and this has become a thing and we can debate this, the statistics, but, but this has become a thing. And, and there's this popular view that, that kids just get a slap on the wrist when they, when they commit crimes and somehow we have the wrong approach. We have to throw the book at them. Okay, whether you're right or wrong about that, if, Somebody steals a car, and let's just assume they stole a car, they didn't kill somebody, right? Um, but if they steal a car and they didn't kill somebody and you send them away for five years, um, their life is not going to improve. And, and they are likely to come out after those five years or three years or two years and, and their life will be destroyed. Um, and again, they have no job, no education and no social support system. And now they're back in Stanford or in New Haven. And what do you do with that person? So that's why criminal justice reform is, is important. Have we gotten it totally right yet? I'm sure we haven't, but we have to find a way not to send, especially young people away and, and just and just sentence them, not just to the two years or the five years, or the 10 years, but to a life of, to a life of dereliction. Because we will pay for it ultimately. So you've weighed in with some other attorneys generals about two voting rights laws in Arizona. Make the case that the Connecticut attorney general should be involved in Arizona's laws. So uh, really important case. It, what other states do affects us every single day. You know, and on the one hand, it's a very easy argument to make. They make precedent um, in their in their legislature, in their state courts. They make laws and then there are lawsuits and, and, and court decisions that may bear on Connecticut. So, for example, during the first few months of COVID, when we were trying to figure out how to manage our elections when people couldn't be in the same room with each other, right? And, and um, there was no good way for it to administer 
the state's election system, we went to a system of absentee balloting here in Connecticut. What other states like Arizona have to say about absentee balloting is important to Connecticut because it's really easy for one side or another in a court case to say, well, in Arizona or New York or Massachusetts, they did it this way and we should do it this way too. And, and it's particularly important when someone, when a state like Massachusetts, New, New Jersey, New York does something because judges and leaders in Connecticut look to what New York, New Jersey, and Massachusetts do because there are sister states, they're close by, they have similar populations. So that's why it's instructive. I think from a larger perspective, um, it's really important because states have found that when we act together, we have much more of an ability to impact what happens, not just in our own states, but at a national level. And sometimes it really comes to a head when I'm sorry to say that, you know, 18 of my Republican colleagues went to the Supreme Court in December and asked the Supreme Court to overturn the presidential election, right? And um, the rest of us joined together and, and most of us Democrats, not all, there are some Republicans with us who went and said, no, you can't do that. And thankfully the Supreme Court did not take that case. And that's when, um, that's when it really matters. Well, that's a good segue. It's almost like you're reading my notes into the oh. next point <laughs> of, you know, the attorneys generals and then having it bubble up to the national level. You know, just within the past few weeks, you joined a bipartisan coalition of other attorney generals to urge Congress to pass the bipartisan No Hate Act. Yeah which would provide state and local governments and law enforcement agencies the tools and resources to understand, identify, and report hate crimes, and as a result, help prevent them. You've said we are in the midst of a national reckoning on hate, racism, and violent extremism. And you cited the recent wave of attacks on Asian Americans across the country. What tools and resources do law enforcement agencies need to deal with hate crimes? Well, oh, that's, a, that's a big question. Um, you know, when I became attorney general, one of the very first things I did was I went to a meeting in Washington and all 56 of us, because you have states and territories in the district. So all 56 of us AGs got a briefing from the deputy director of the FBI. And he told us at that time, and by the way, President Trump was president uh, when this happened. So there's the deputy director of the FBI at that time. And he said the number one domestic law enforcement threat and domestic terror threat is the rise of hate and extremism. And I think at that time, we understood what he was saying, but I don't think that we understood the full scope and risk at that time of how, um, how people are really unsafe and how destabilizing the rise in hate and extremism, particularly on online platforms is to our country and our democracy. The short answer is there's no good answers to any of this. Um, I just did a Zoom for an hour and a half before this one. I jumped off early to talk about section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, which addresses the liability or not really no liability for Facebook, Twitter and other online platforms for hate and extremism on their platforms. And there, there aren't any good answers. I think the best I can say is um, we need more funding for several areas. One, the technology resources to track online hate and to stop it, right? I mean, criminals, particularly technology enabled criminals are always a couple steps ahead. And then you need to develop and pay for the professionals who, who can spot um, problems online and, and the ways in which the, the online platforms algorithmically enable and supercharge hate speech and extremism. So, man, if I had a good answer to this, um, you know, we would have solved the problem by now. It's, it, it's a huge challenge. And um, 
uh, you and I both love the First Amendment as much as anybody else, but how you deal with extremism is a very difficult question. Well, to that point, you know, do you have any idea in terms of what's behind this recent wave of attacks on Asian Americans? Uh, I do. Uh, I, I think President Trump gave voice to hate uh, against Asian Americans when he called it the, the China virus or the Kung flu. And, you know, I guess I understand that he thought he was just being clever, right? Or, um, or just saying something, words that he thought catered to a particular sentiment. I, I'm obviously not giving him that much credit, but I will say that what I, the reason why I'm saying that is because words matter, especially when you're the most powerful man in the world. And I think he's given voice to people to act out on their hate and extremism. Now, that being said, I don't, I think, I think a lot of that and what President Trump said was symptomatic of, of how a lot of people are feeling. And that's a bigger problem, right? Uh, so, um, uh, again, I, I think that there's, there's a lot of fear about uh, China. There's a, a lot of fear and, and a lot of scapegoating and I hate this word, but it's the only word I can think of otherizing of Asian Americans. And this isn't the first time that we've blamed other people. And this is not the first time we've blamed Asian Americans for something we're unhappy about in this country, the Vietnam War, World War II, Pearl Harbor. I mean, this is a recurring theme and it's happening again. You know, here's what I would say about all of this. What I really quarrel with is this idea that there's somehow virtue in saying whatever the hell you want to say, no matter the consequences, because it's your God-given First Amendment right, and that there's virtue in being a jerk or being mean or just telling it like it is and insulting uh, without regard to whether you insult somebody, offend somebody, you know, endanger somebody's life. And my view is that's not how I was brought up. There's no virtue in that. And I'm not telling you you can't express your opinion about social security and the solvency of the social security trust fund, right? Or even, you know, criminal justice reform or, um, any number of, 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 of public policy issues, you know, civil rights, all of those sorts of things. Yeah, sure, we can have a debate about it, but you don't have to be a jerk about it or worse. And I just don't think there's any virtue in treating people that way. But somehow it has developed that it's not only good to be that way to other people, it is to be celebrated that, that, that we should have a caustic and, and confrontational and hateful relationship with each other. No, we're not gonna get anywhere with that. So working with other attorneys general to try and help the students of some for-profit schools have their student loan debt canceled has been a priority for you. Yeah. What's happening on that front? And why did AGs recently ask the US Department of Education to cancel federal student loan debt? So it's like whack-a-mole. Um, that's the status of it. And I don't have to tell you that you want to talk about Eisenhower's warning about the military industrial complex. How about the educational industrial complex, right? How much is it going to cost for you to send your kids and for me to send my kids to college? It's, it's obscene. And we're in an arms race um, in higher education that seems to be insatiable. Well, I remember growing up and going out to stores with my family for whatever reason, it was a sleepy state school. You know, UConn is stores is in many respects, it's beautiful, but it's like some parts of their Taj Mahal. Right. I mean, like, and I'm not saying that UConn doesn't need to compete. I'm going to get criticized for this, but you know, I'm not saying that Gamble shouldn't be nice, but when does it end? 
And where does it end? And who's cutting the bill? We are. And by the way, I really mean we are because most student loan debt now is owned by the American people. And people don't realize that. You know, when we were in college, there was a lot more private student loan lending. City had a big student loan operation. There, you know, there were, there were a lot more state-based lenders. That has largely been rolled up into the federal government over the last decade. And so at the end of the day, if we were to forgive up to $50,000 of that debt, it's really the American people forgiving that debt. And um, why is that important? Well, because it's really a form of stimulus and, and, and in a way a tax cut, right? It's, it's, it's government spending. And the question is how do you want to administer stimulus, right? Economic, economic incentives are essentially targeted tax breaks right? And, and they're a form of stimulus. We want to grow the movie industry in Connecticut, um, which we did. And, and now it's largely gone, right? Because everybody was doing it. And, and so we provided stimulus to that industry by tax incentives and, and government spending and investment. Um, you know, bailouts are stimulus, right? Um, uh, and and so when we think about how we're going to do stimulus now post COVID, one of the biggest drags on, on, on our economy is student loan debt. You know, I still owe money. Um, and uh, the, the drag on me is not nearly as profound as somebody who paid for ITT, for example, um, took out loans to go to ITT, didn't get anything out of it. And now they're up a creek, 25, 50, 100 grand. And you want to talk about a drag, that person can't buy a house, probably can't get a credit card, right? Because their credit's probably shot. Um, um, and can't take risk, can't open a business, can't take the kind of economic and, and growth generating risk that the American economy depends on people to take. So that's why I'm in favor of doing a where better place to, to provide stimulus than to student loan borrowers who tend to be younger and have young families. You've been warning your constituents about consumer scams, yeah. especially online scams. Yeah. Can you give examples of one or two of those social media scams these days that people are falling victim to? And maybe more importantly, how do we protect ourselves from them? So there are so many. Uh, the most recent one are um, vaccine related scams. So, you know, buy this therapy and it's better than the vaccine or pay us money and you can jump the line and get your vaccine quicker. Or the most recent one that really troubles me, buy a fake vaccine card. And I, of course, have been very vocal about the vaccine. Just take it you know, enough already. Um, we're in the middle of a global pandemic. And if you choose not to take it, which is your right, don't lie about it. You need to live with the consequences of not taking it, right? And if you're unable to go to a school or go to work or send your kids to school because you have made that choice, that's your choice. But you can't lie about it. And so that's another I guess that's a scam, right? That people are running both the buyer and the seller. You know, there are other scams, they're heartbreaking. The, the romance scam was one that we dealt with, you know, right when I became attorney general. And you read this and you're like, is that really happening? Like, yes, it's happening. People are falling in love online with somebody who's in another country who's taking advantage of them. And they literally, like, they send all their money. And, 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 and one of the most recent ones that I've dealt with, my mom was a victim of this, is the overpayment scam, where you buy something. Uh, I'm sorry, you, you're selling something or you're providing a service, you know, 
uh, renting an apartment, you know, selling a piece of equipment and selling household goods. And you, 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 you sell your good or service to somebody on Facebook and they send you a check and the check is for too much money. And so they say, ah, oh, you know, I messed up. Why don't you keep a little bit of the too much money? Send me the difference, right? In cash or gift cards or wire it to me. And then, you know, when the check clears, we'll be even. And then you realize that the original check they sent you wasn't any good. And now you've sent them the quote unquote difference. And people make off with tens of thousands of dollars that way. So what I would say to people, always say to people is, just be careful, um, know what you know, which is uh, people are trying to scam you. No one's gonna call you on the phone, send you an email and demand payment right there and then for X, Y, and Z. And, and if you think somebody's calling you about bill collection or a charity and it may be legit, don't respond right away hang up the phone, take a name, take a number, check it out yourself. And if you want to give the soldier socks, for example, right, you do it yourself, make a fresh call or get on the website yourself and give, and don't respond to somebody trying to scam you out of what, what has become a lot of money. And it's, here's the thing about it too, is in our interconnected world, it's so cheap to do this, to use technology, to, to swindle people so is so easy. And so if you just remember all that and know what you know, then, then you won't be a victim. So we've talked a lot about your career and official duties as Attorney General Tong, but you also have a wonderful, beautiful family too. You mentioned Liz earlier, you and your wife have demanding jobs. She's also an attorney. You know, I know you were in op-ed during the beginning of COVID in terms of how you actually appreciated getting some family time back. What advice do you have for our audience about striking the right work family balance? First of all, accept that there is no balance. You know, a balance seems to imply that there's like some 50 50 in, and that you can properly calibrate between family, your own life and work. It's just, it's just a matter of priorities. And Liz and Eleanor, Penelope and Sasha are my number one priority. And so that's just the deal. You know, Sasha has flag football four o'clock to five 30 every Friday. You want me to do a podcast between four and five 30? I'm not going to do it. Right. And, that, and, and some politicians make the opposite choice. You, you and I both know politicians who just go seven days a week, you know, 10 hours a day. And they don't have balance either. That's just not how, that's not my priority. My priority are, are my family and, and my own personal sanity. So don't try to find balance. Just say what's important to you and stick to it. So being in the podcast, we talked about how you got to where you are today. What's ahead for you in the future? I am so grateful for this opportunity and as you know, um, I've had other opportunities and, and they haven't always worked out. And um, one thing I live by, I learned from a guy named Joe McGee um, here in Stanford. Politics is all about how you get up off the canvas. That's probably true about life too. And I've, I've been knocked on. I've gotten up the canvas more than once. And what I can tell you is I'm where I should be. I can't think of five lawyer jobs I'd rather have, to be honest. So um, it's quite a thing to wake up in the morning and be like, yeah, this is right. This is good for me. So that's how I feel. Attorney General William Tong, thanks so much for being with us today. Thank you, Chris. I know you're not feeling great after your second shot, so I really appreciate your time. No, you know, I made it through, but it's easy talking to you and Chris, I always appreciate you being a great friend and a great no, neighbor. Likewise. Likewise. Thanks for your time. And thank you to our audience for tuning in to Next Steps Forward. I'm Chris Meek. For more details about upcoming shows and guests, please follow me on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Chris Meek public figure and on Twitter at Chris Meek underscore USA. 
We'll be back next Tuesday, same time, same place, with another leader from the world of business, politics, sports, or entertainment. Until then, stay safe and keep taking your next steps forward.